thank you also to the, uh, the organizing committee of SLED for inviting me here today. Um, and I'm going to be presenting some of that ethnographic research that Jennifer mentioned uh, that I conducted in, in Ukrainian language classrooms. But I'm also going to add to it uh, with some more recent interview data that I collected as a follow-up to that study. And the focus of the research is on the teaching of Ukrainian as the national language in Ukraine. Um, now, the framework that I am using is language socialization, and I'll just briefly describe that for anyone who may not be familiar with it. Uh, essentially, language socialization is the process through which novices become members of a community through participation in routine interactions with more experienced members. So along with a language, a novice acquires a way of thinking, acting, and being in the world. Now the particular community uh, in which the children uh, in my study were being socialized was a linguistic community. Uh, now the definition I'm showing you here comes from Michael Silverstein, uh, but you can also find uh, the concept in Vaudier. And um, the idea here, here is that what unites a linguistic community is not a set of language practices, but a set of language ideologies that define what counts as legitimate language. In the modern nation state, this language is most often the national language that has been standardized and legitimated through institutionalization in government, media, and of course, education. Um, and this language then subsequently um, becomes the norm uh, against which all linguistic practice, practices are measured. Language usage that deviates from the standard norms is then viewed as incorrect. Now a little bit of background to, uh, to my study, just to contextualize it a little bit. Uh, the Ukrainian language is part of the same language family as Russian and Belarusian. Uh, and these languages are syntactically similar, uh, but they do differ in phonology and to some extent in morphology and lexicon. Now Ukrainian is currently the sole state language of Ukraine, um, although that's under debate currently, but uh, it still is the sole state language of Ukraine. Uh, many, however, do see it as under threat, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, first of all, uh, during the Soviet period, Russian was the lingua franca of the Soviet Union. And as a result, all Ukrainians who uh, grew up in that period, uh, at, at the very least, learned Russian as a second language. Um, there um, is also a large ethnic Russian population in Ukraine, um, and there are also other ethnic minorities who use Russian as their everyday language. Um, in addition, there uh, has been fairly extensive language shift by uh, Ukrainians from Ukrainian to Russian uh, due to the prestige of Russian, not only during the Soviet period, but even earlier when Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and finally, and most relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, is there is widespread use of a, a hybrid Russian-Ukrainian mix that's known uh, locally as Suzhik. Uh, now, Suzhik is a derogatory term. Uh, it originally referred to an admixture of wheat and rye. That is, it's adulterated grain. Um, and uh, if you read some of the Ukrainian accounts of this, it's often characterized as a lingering residue of Russian linguistic domination. Uh, that the Russian language has invaded the Ukrainian language just as the Russian Empire invaded Ukraine. Uh, it's also seen as a threat to the reestablishment of Ukrainian as a quote a real language or a normal language, uh, which by which is meant uh, an unmixed or pure language. And this is going to be the focus of my talk today. So let me just say a few words about Suzhik. Uh, this is a sign uh, in a streetcar in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, and I'll just translate at the top. It says, attention, respected passengers, let's speak correctly and beautifully. <laughs> um, below, we have two columns. This is the correct, and this is the incorrect. Um, and these are various handy phrases like, next stop, and things you might say on a streetcar. Um, the ones in the correct column are standard Ukrainian. The ones in the incorrect column are usually Sushik. 
mixed language. Uh, there is, there, although things that you would commonly hear. So even in the streetcar, they uh, they're trying to spread the message of this is incorrect. But but these negative attitudes uh, can also be found at the micro level of you know everyday people. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of quotations. These are come from interviews I had with parents of the children uh, in my studies. Uh, for example, this woman um, refers to the Ukrainian language as having been polluted by Russianism, as she calls it. Uh, and here, this um, father uh, talks about it. He started learning English, um, but then became you know, very aware that his Ukrainian had a lot of Russian words, and he characterizes it as speaking badly and a sign that he doesn't really even know his own language. Okay, so that gives you a sense of, of the basic attitudes. And these are the attitudes that shape the classroom error correction practices that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, the setting of the research was in this area of Ukraine, a small city. Uh, uh, in this city, both Ukrainian and Russian are widely spoken. Uh, and code switching and code mixing are also quite common there. <coughs> um, I, the uh, ethnographic phase of this study, uh, I collected data at two schools. I'm calling school A and school B. Uh, I was in fifth grade Ukrainian language and literature classes. And the data collection comprised first field notes and video recordings of classroom interaction. Uh, interviews with Ukrainian teachers, school principals and parents, um, a demographic questionnaire that was completed by parents, uh, and also a collection of textbooks and other class materials. Uh, there were two Ukrainian teachers. Uh, the teacher at school A was uh, Olena Maksimovna. Uh, in her early 30s, she had been teaching Ukrainian for six years at the time. Uh, and the teacher at school B was a male, uh, Viktor Viktorovich. Uh, in his late 40s, he had been teaching Ukrainian for 26 years. There were 47 children uh, in the two classes that participated in the study. Um, now you'll note here from the first column, you see the majority, 68%, uh, were ethnic Ukrainian. That is, both parents identified themselves as Ukrainian on my questionnaire. Um, however, uh, you'll note here that only about a third of, the, of these children came from homes in which exclusively Ukrainian was spoken. Uh, the remainder, for the remainder, the home language was either Russian, uh, the other here um, is Armenian, uh, and uh, also a combination of Ukrainian and Russian in uh, about 38% of the homes. Um, Okay, so in other words, the children, these children obviously had widespread exposure to, to both Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, in school, um, it, it's an interesting situation. Um, it was clear that at both schools, children were certainly strongly encouraged to use Ukrainian <coughs> at all times. However, there were no restrictions on language choice outside of class. And um, I frequently heard children using Russian during break time, and they were never scolded for, for doing so. However, during the lessons, it, this was definitely a Ukrainian-only environment. All, all lessons, not only Ukrainian language, but all the subjects were taught in Ukrainian. Um, however, um, not surprisingly, um, when children spoke Ukrainian in class, uh, they did often mix in some Russian. Um, and their use of Russian can be uh, classified in several ways. For instance, they sometimes use Russian words uh, that were, they're not in standard Ukrainian lexicon at all. Um, they sometimes use words that are actually in the lexicon of both languages, because there is some overlap. But they pronounce these words following Russian phonological norms, so instead of Ukrainian. Um, and then the most interesting category are the Russianisms. Uh, these are words that follow Ukrainian phonology and would seem to be Ukrainian, but they were seen as either originating in Russian um, or evincing Russian patterns for word formation. And we're not going to be looking at an example of that in a minute. Now when uh, the children used forms like this, these were invariably treated by teachers as errors in need of remediation. 
and we're going to take a quick look at a couple examples. Um, the first example I'm going to show you comes from School B. Um, so Jennifer, could you maybe hand out the transcripts? I have. <coughs> it might be easier for you to look at the transcripts on the paper, but I'll have them up here. Um, I first want to give you a little background. Um, in, in, at this point, uh, the uh, children have read a story, and the story is about a little boy who finds a, 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 an injured pigeon, and he adopts it uh, as a pet. And, uh, but at one point, he skips school to stay home and play with this pigeon. And so his father gets very angry, and the father takes the pigeon away and goes off uh, on a business trip to another part of the country and takes the pigeon. Um, so it, the teacher has asked the children to retell the story, and that's what's happening at this particular moment. The boy, little boy is talking about this particular moment. So uh, the teacher asks him, uh, you know, how did his father punish the boy, Stepanko? Um, and the boy starts to answer in line two. Now you'll notice uh, in his answer, he uses the word, it's highlighted in red here, commandero, which means business trip. Um, however, this turns out to be what I, I'm calling a trouble source. Because what happens is even before the boy finishes his turn, the teacher interrupts uh, with a correction. That is, he replaces the word commandorovka with a different word, vidrajin, which also means business trip. And the boy in turn, uh, in line four, uh, then takes up that replacement word and sticks it into his turn and redoes that what the problematic portion of his turn. Uh, what's interesting about um, Komandorovka is that in Soviet era Ukrainian dictionaries it was listed as a synonym of Vidrajinya. Uh, however, it is a loan word from German, came into Ukrainian via Russian, and it's also a cognate of a Russian word, Komandorovka. So although the word apparently was once officially accepted in standard Ukrainian, uh, its Russian connections apparently now make it suspect. It is replaced with a more Ukrainian word. Uh, now this is the typical pattern for error correction in both of the classrooms. It is that the child uses a, some Russian word, the teacher interrupts, replaces it with the Ukrainian word, and then the child takes it up, repeats the word, whatever, and continues. Um, so, uh, my interpretation of this is essentially that um, correcting these kinds of errors was seen as important enough that you stop whatever you were doing, in this case telling a story, um, to get, become engaged in what we would call doing correction. And we also would note that both parties, the teacher and the child, are collaboratively constructing and displaying a stance towards the mixed form as somehow problematic. And this just happened over and over and over and over again in both of the classrooms, dozens, dozens of times. Uh, I want to show you another example from School B. Uh, plays out slightly differently. Um, here the teacher, Olena Maksimovna, has asked Hana to come up to the front of the room and recite her favorite poem. Um, and Hana goes up there and she's uh, in line three she starts to announce her favorite poem, um, and uh, as you see again in red, she, she uses the word Lubimi, or favorite. Um, this is also a Russian word. So again, we see the same pattern, she, this becomes a trouble source. Um, again, before she kind of can finish, the, um, the teacher interrupts her, uh, first utters oi, and then replaces the, uh, the word with the Ukrainian word Ulubini, which means favorite. I mean, um, yeah, Ulubini, which means favorite. Um, and then again, you know, Hana takes the word Ulubini and continues on and then goes on and recites her poem. Um, so again, this kind of follows the typical pattern, but uh, there is a, some variation here, uh, as you have probably noticed, right here, um, where in fact Hana interrupts herself where she, um, this E, eh, uh, which sometimes is interpreted as signaling a possible self-correction. Um, she starts to redo the turn, she repeats the word my, and then she gets ooh, 
which is, is as far as she gets before the teacher comes in. But we could certainly guess that that U may in fact be <coughs> the beginning of the word U Lubini. That is that Hannah was about to self-correct. Uh, now, I don't have too many examples of children self-correcting, um, primarily because the teachers uh, were in there so quickly that they didn't, the kids really didn't have a chance to ever do it. Um, <laughs> But uh, the presence of things like this suggestively suggests to me that the children were indeed taking up both the practices and the ideologies of pure language and using them to correct themselves. So a quick summing up of, of this, what we have so far. Um, the error correction in these classrooms were reproducing the language ideologies that prescribe use of Russian forms in Ukrainian as a violation of supposedly natural boundaries between languages. The children actively participated in these routines by taking up the replacement forms and correcting similar errors by themselves, and occasionally uh, they corrected their classmates. Uh, and these routines were then socializing children both into speaking Ukrainian correctly and into the ideologies that shape what speaking correctly means. Now this is where the ethnographic study ended. Uh, but I was very curious to find out whether the children had indeed been socialized into these ideologies versus simply displaying them in the classroom. And so four years later, I returned to the site of the original study, and I conducted interviews with 39 of the children. At, at that time, they were age 14 to 15. And going into this, I had a few expectations. Uh, I suspected that the young people would largely support the ideologies of pure Ukrainian that had been promoted in the classroom and also in Ukrainian society generally. And I also thought that given the uh, relative formality of the interview it's being audio recorded and they're talking to a foreign researcher, that the, uh, the young people would be really careful about their language use. Now my former supposition was largely upheld the second was a more mixed. Um, when asked about Sujik, uh, my interviewees overwhelmingly <coughs> responded with negative uh, responses. They characterized it as unnatural, as nonsensical. They described it as unpleasant, incorrect, unesthetic, not beautiful, and funny. Uh, and often they laughed when I mentioned it. On the other hand, none of the interviews was entirely free of mixing. And in some cases, mixing was quite prevalent. And I'm going to look at an instance um, from one interview in which uh, there was mixing, but it was also noticed by the participants and how they responded to it. Uh, this is on the back of your handout. Uh, this comes from an interview with three young people at School B, Alex, Bika, and Nina. School A. Um, all of these young people identified Ukrainian as their home language. Uh, however, they also claimed not to speak it very well. And indeed, this interview was quite notable, both for its use of a colloquial variety of Ukrainian, uh, as well as numerous instances of code mixing. Uh, now, they did also characterize Sujik in negative terms. For example, Vika said it would be better to eliminate it from the language. Although she had also added that um, this was probably impossible, a stance to which Nina aligned. Uh, now the incident which we'll examine here occurred a few minutes after that declaration. And A is Alex, the, the male, um, and he's responding to my question about what the term Mova means to them. And Vietnamova can be translated as native language or mother tongue. Um, in Ukraine, this term tends to be defined, be defined in very personal ways. That is, your Vietnamova is a language you feel a very close personal connection to. And I think that's basically what Alex is, is saying here. Um, he's uh, he's giving me a narrative about some unidentified patriot who goes abroad only to discover that his heart belongs to his homeland. So we'll notice he's, he starts to talk about this story. It's not terribly coherent. But uh, in line five, um, he interrupts himself. He starts to say a word, breaks it off, replaces it. 
Um, the word that he cuts off is apparent, appear, appears to be the Russian word, zapomnil, which means remember. Uh, he replaces it with the Ukrainian zapamyatav, remember. So in other words, um, the, the correction is essentially what we saw in the classroom, except this time Alex accomplishes it on his own. And this allows him to display uh, sufficient competency in standard Ukrainian to be able to monitor and correct his own speech, and thus to recover from a potential misstep. He is, however, less successful uh, a few turns later. Uh, notice at line seven, we're kind of interrupted because there's some kids singing really badly in the next room, and everybody kind of laughs. Um, and then, but then Alex goes on with his story. So he resumes here in line eight, um, but he again runs into difficulty in line nine. Now what happens here, uh, he starts to say a word, and then he holds the sound, roll, like that. Um, now this can often indicate uh, a word search. That's one way of interpreting it. He can't quite come up with the word he's looking for. And that apparently is the way Nina and Vika interpret this, because both of them, in turn, offer some possible candidates to complete um, Alex's turn. Um, Nina says, in Ukraine, and Vika says, in his homeland. But it's only <coughs> Vika's turn that actually fits, phonologically, with what uh, Alex has said so far. Uh, now what happens next, again, I'm going to give you two interpretations. Uh, what happens next is Alex does indeed take that word, and he repeats it a couple of times in his homeland, in his homeland. So it appears that Alex is, is he's just decided, yes, this is the word I meant. Um, however, we might note the laughter that precedes this. Both Nina and Vika laugh after Vika's uh, suggestion of Rodinia, and immediately after, Nina characterizes this as Sushuk. And Alex also says it. And in fact, the word rodinye is a Russian word. Um, now, we also might note, if you, if, you, if you don't see it here, but if you go back, when Vika offered that word, uh, she did so in what I'm calling smile voice, which is kind of like, no rodinye. So it's offered in a somewhat odd way. And then, of course, there's the laughter. So. Um, I think Vika is certainly well aware when she offers it that it's a Russian word. Um, and she's teasing Alex for having almost uttered this. Uh, finally, um, Alex, down in line 20, uh, right, so to reanalyze this, this in fact is not the completion of an error correction sequence or of a word search sequence, it's a trouble source. Uh, and that Alex then self corrects. He himself supplies the Ukrainian word, Bakhtikh China, and he repeats it again uh, while the, the young women are still giggling while this is going on. Um, so uh, it still becomes a moment of humor for everyone concerned. Um, however, with um, this self correction, Alex again is at least able to partially redeem himself to claim an interactional identity as a flawed but not totally incompetent speaker of standard Ukrainian. So I'm just going to conclude here. Um, I think the interviews provided some evidence that these young people have indeed taken up the language ideologies promoted in their classrooms that prescribe language mixing, uh, as seen in things such as their meta discourses on Sushik, self and other correction of Russian and other mixed forms in the interviews, and labeling the, such usages as Sushik. Um, and these stances serve as a resource through which these, uh, the interview participants could in fact enact personas as good, uh, good students who had um, absorbed the lessons of the Ukrainian language teachers and who were cognizant of what constitutes proper verbal, verbal behavior, uh, as well as good interview subjects uh, who were ready and willing to provide the traditional anti surgic line for me. Uh, nevertheless, it was also clear that their language practices are at odds with this ideology, these ideologies. Uh, the relatively high frequency of Russian or hybrid forms in the speech of some individuals, such as Alex, Vika, and Nina, and we didn't really see examples of it, but it was quite common. Um, 
and that most of these instances were not, in fact, noticed by the participants. We looked at a couple of cases where they were, but most of them were not. And this suggests to me that, um, that language mixing may, in fact, constitute the default language for um, some of these young people, at least when they're speaking Ukrainian outside of the controlled environment of the classroom. And I'd like to propose that the error correction practices that I observed in the interviews um, could be seen as a strategy uh, that allowed the young people to simultaneously perform two seemingly contradictory linguistic personas and negotiate the ambiguities of the interview context. That is, they could display some degree of facility in a prestige language variety, standard Ukrainian, in front of me, the foreign researcher, in a context in which pure language norms were being vigorously defended. On the other hand, they could also show solidarity with their peers through use of a shared mixed code. So I'm basically saying that these young people, when they were together, normally would be using this mixed variety, and they continued to do so uh, but because they were now in a situation in which it might not be entirely proper, they sometimes corrected it. Um, and therefore, this error correction uh, could offer a means of taking a line that reconciled these two positions, uh, enabling the interviewees to present themselves as linguistically competent individuals who recognized but did not always choose to honor the constraints against code switching and code mixing imposed at the macro-social level by purist language ideologies, and at the micro-social level by their own support of these ideologies. And that's it. Thank you.